your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is where we're at. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. You will need a, a Bible. We're going we're gonna to plow through this chapter, looking at it line by line, and look at the things that we discover. It's a little strange that we're in this section because we're in a Life of Christ series, and yet we start talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, understanding the need to talk about the filling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about that. But one of the natural things that comes up on that topic is the issue of tongues and interpretation and prophecy and those kind of things. So I want to talk about that. I want to put it on the table. Let's take a clear look at the issue of tongues and interpretation uh, as it relates to the Christian life and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul, when he was beginning this section to the church of Corinth, he said in chapter 12, he said, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. So these are areas that we should not be ignorant in. And then he gives instruction concerning the spiritual gifts. Now remember, if you're with, with us, you know the background on this is that Paul's writing to a church that's out of control. They have their services, and on the outside, they look, man, it's a charismatic church. Things are happening. The, the, it looks like the Spirit is moving, and yet there's chaos. There's, uh, there's flat-out sin that's going on in the church, and, and so there's a lot going on that he has to address in this letter. And so he's addressing it just point by point, going through a letter that he received from somebody from the church. And so he's addressing these points, points by point the issue of, of spiritual gifts. He talked about how we're all part of the body of Christ. Remember that last time. Find that area where you fit into the body of Christ and serve there. We all have different gifts. We spent some time on that. And then if you want to pursue the greatest gift, pursue love. And in chapter 13, he talked about love. He gave us a definition of love. And then he talked about how the gifts of the Spirit, those things are not going to pass away until Jesus returns. And we looked at that. That lands us right here in chapter 14. Again, stay tuned with us. Let's go through this. It says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. All right, he says, pursue love. You want to pursue something? Pursue to love one another. We'll talk about spiritual gifts and all these things, but this is probably one of the biggest topics that, that divide a church. I was talking to a pastor from another church that happened to be here last service and talked to him after between the services, and he says they had a thing going on in their particular denomination, um, and uh, this is the very topic that destroyed one of their outreaches was this issue of spiritual gifts. And he talked about how painful that was. Well, here's the thing is that this is an issue that we love to divide over. Guys, listen, pursue love. Pursue love. This is a non-essential issue that we're talking about. I had somebody in the foyer after first service. This is the most controversial message of the year. I love it. I love it. I had somebody after first service. It was right in my chest. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. Well, you know, this is probably not the time or the place to do that. I'd like to dialogue with you, but probably not a good time to do that. And um, this issue of spiritual gifts, let me tell you this is that part of the body of Christ is that we need to have unity among the basics of Christianity. The deity of Jesus Christ, His return, you know, salvation by grace alone. Those things, we must have unity if we're going to be Christians. But in the non-essentials, such as, are you going to speak in tongues or not? Such as baptism. We've got baptisms after the next service. And baptism, you sprinkle or dunk them or whatever. Just get them wet, whatever, you know. <laughs> and so these kind of issues, we, we should not be dividing over. We don't need to pick fights over these. And so uh, this issue of spiritual gifts, before he gets in, he says, pursue love. Pursue love. And yet Christians, you know, we're going to run from church to church because the latest, greatest thing that's going on. Pursue love. The Bible tells us in Mark's gospel, the last, the last little section there, it says, these signs will follow them that believe. So listen to that. And he gives a list of some of the sign gifts. He said, these signs will follow them that believe. Not them that believe will follow after all these signs and wonders. We don't go chasing. We're not, we're not sign chasers. We're not God chasers. Hello? Remember that book? I'm God chaser. Well, yeah, you're chasing God like the mouse chased the cat, all right? God is in control. God is always in control, and uh, he's the one that sought us out. And yes, I'm pursuing love. I'm pursuing uh, following God. I mean, all those things are true, 
But here's the thing is that we need to pursue love and not divide the church over it. But we need to desire spiritual gifts. Not be ignorant towards them. And we ought to desire those things that God has for us. Notice what he says here. But especially that you may prophesy. Prophecy is important. Okay, uh, He's going to do the contrast here in this chapter between prophecy and tongues. Prophecy edifies the church, builds up the church. Okay, prophecy is someone speaking from God's heart to people. Prophecy happens behind this pulpit. Prophecy happens because we're going through the Word of God. Prophecy is, again, and I believe that God wants to speak to His people. But uh, you, you know that it's happening because so many times after the service, our people say, you know, God spoke to me this through His Word. God spoke to me this during the service. I hear that over and over again. Wednesday night, listen, talking to a gal. God just got a hold of her and shook her life. Praise God. It's the, it's the Word of God you know, that is, is, is going out and it's touching our lives. Prophecy still happens today. We need to be open to the things of God. But we also need to be open, as we're going to see here, if there's rules, there's, there's, there's an order of things. And the Bible says in prophecy that, look, if someone's going to prophesy, thus saith the Lord, others are to judge that. Is that true? Someone says, listen, by definition, if someone says, thus saith the Lord, and it doesn't come to pass, by definition, that person's what? A is a false prophet. Why don't we get that? It is amazing. Some very intelligent people will follow a prophet that said, thus saith the Lord, and it did not come to pass. Now, it cannot come to pass because that prophet is gone. That prophet is dead. It cannot come to pass. By definition, that prophet is a false prophet. Well, that's just, that's just picking on people. That's, not, that's just Bible. We're afraid to stand up and say, you know what? If they say, thus saith the Lord, and it doesn't come to pass, though I have a lot of other problems with your prophet, though if they say, thus saith the Lord, and it doesn't come to pass, that person's a false prophet. I was telling somebody that... Um, a couple years ago, just trying to reason with them. And he says to me, he says to me, you're hurting my feelings. Oh. I was still in the, uh, if, you, if you've been going to this church, you know that God's been mellowing me and working on me. Hello. I still got a long ways to go, but I wasn't so mellowed back then because I told him, I says, I don't give a rip about your feelings. I give a rip about your soul, you know, and you're following a prophet that was a liar. You know, and that's, I don't use those terms as freely now, but I still communicate this. Thus saith the Lord, it does not come to pass. That person is a false prophet. That's Bible. That's Bible. All right. And so you can argue all you want. And yet the Bible says that. It says, well, you have to look at it this way or that way. I just want to know what it says here in the word. So prophecy is still going out today. Again, I have to belabor the point. We've got to be careful in this generation. We've got to be careful in these things. But don't throw it all out. God still wants to talk to his people. He still wants to minister to his people. And if we'll listen, he'll speak to our hearts. And God has gifted some to be able to say, you know, I really believe the Lord is saying this to you. And you want to listen with discernment. And you don't want to just throw it out. Now, you understand this? Again, if you're familiar with the charismatic gifts, this is all just, just common to you. But if this is the first time you're hearing it, I'll give, you a, I'll give you some books to read as we get through this. So we'll talk about that. But he says here, especially, but especially that you may prophesy. This is, this is why, because prophecy builds up the church. Tongues and interpretation edifies yourself. Look what it says. <clears throat> Verse 2. For he who speaks in tongues does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. I'll come back to that. But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. He who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, building up, comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. So he's doing the contrast here. Tongues edifies and builds up yourself. Prophecy, on the other hand, blesses the church because God is moving, because God is speaking through his word or through, through a word of prophecy to, a, to an individual's life. But tongues, let's talk about tongues now. What is that all about? Our tongues for today? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Are they misused today? Sure. A lot of things are misused today, but don't throw them out because there's the misuse. We're afraid of them in Christianity. We're afraid of them, at least in, in, in non-charismatic circles. We want to we demonize them or we want to throw them out or we just want to ignore those particular uh, giftings instead of saying, you know, I want to know about them. I want to know what your word. My Bible says that we ought to desire spiritual gifts. And then he goes on and talks about the gift of tongues, the, this, this prayer language that God gives. What is tongues? Tongues is speaking in a language, in our prayer time, speaking in a language that you have not learned. It's something that you have not studied. It is a language. In fact, what does it say earlier? It says, if I speak with the tongue of men or of angels and have not love. So it may be a, a known language. It may be a dead language. It may be a, a language only known to God. And so this, this gift of tongues, it's a, it's, a, it's a gift that is from God. It helps in our prayer life. And notice what it says here. Let's, start, let's just walk through this. Look at verse 2. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. All right, so I've been in charismatic circles where you have someone that's speaking in tongues. And then someone will stand up and interpret that tongue. And many times the interpretation will say something like this. My little children hearken unto me and it'll be a message in tongues. Is that the correct interpretation? Not biblically it's not. Biblically it says a person that's speaking in tongues does not speak to men, but they're speaking to God. All right? Now hold on to this now. Don't fade on me this early. You're in trouble. You start fading now. All right? So here's the thing. If you go back to like Acts chapter 2 where, they're, where they are all speaking with tongues. The Bible says that as they come out, they were speaking in tongues. And all these people from all these different generations, or the, these different, uh, not generations, but all these different uh, geographical areas was there. And they heard them speaking. It's a gift of tongues. It's also a specific gift for that particular passage. God allowed them to hear without an interpreter. He wanted them to know. What were they speaking? They were speaking the wonderful works of God. They were speaking praises to God. Always consistently in the word of God. It's, it's, it's edifying yourself. You're praising God. But he says here, look at this. He speaks, who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. It says, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. In the spirit, you're speaking directly to God. So why, why do we need this gift? Why is this a gift that we would seek? Or why would we need this, the gift of tongues? There's several reasons. One of the reasons is, one of the reasons is, not only is it biblical, not only is it practiced in the book of Acts and in the early church, not only do we have that heritage of going along, but it's important for our prayer life. Because like when I moved, first moved here to Salt Lake City, we moved during the worst snowstorm in, in its recent history. You remember that back about almost 20 years ago now? We just got buried, okay? And there was inversions that was here. So we moved here, and I really thought God was punishing me. Now it's been confirmed. But, um, <laughs> but as we moved here, as we moved here, it was like it, the, the inversion was here, and you could not see these mountains at all. And so I was a little upset that God was making me come here and, and uh, you know, long, long story. Uh, but then, then uh, the snow started melting and the inversion cleared. And I saw the beauty of these mountains right here. And I remember exactly where I was at, up in these mountains up here. And I pulled the car over and I said, God, thank you for sending me here. But as I, as I look at these mountains and the beauty of these mountains, my vocabulary would break down. This is, so this is so beautiful, God. How, you know, and tried to express that. Or my love for God. My love for God. I can feel, now here's the idea. I can feel much broader than I can express through my narrow, this narrow channel of intellect. And so I say, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. That kind of breaks down. And because my vocabulary is very limited. Again, I can feel very broad. I can feel, have these great feelings, but I can't, I can't vocalize it very well because of my limit, my limit in, in, in my intellect and my vocabulary. So what does tongues do? Tongues is a way to bypass not your brain, you're not just checking out your brain acting weird, not that. What you're doing is you're bypassing your intellect. You're bypassing your, 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 uh, your language and be able to go directly to God. Do you understand that? Now, if this is new to you, you're going, what is he talking about? Just hang in there now. Just because it's hard doesn't mean we don't need to be teaching it and talking about it, right? Because the Bible speaks about this. What is this gift of tongues, all right? It's God, it, it, God helps us with our prayer life. The Bible also says in the book of Romans, it says this. 
It says that there's times that you go to prayer. Uh, it's Romans 8. There's times you go to prayer and you don't know how to pray. But it says the spirit within us groans. There's times I don't know how to pray. I just know that there's, there's something going on. I need to be praying and I don't know how to pray. That's Romans right there. I don't know how to pray. But here, my spirit, my spirit bypassing, bypassing those things, be able to plug directly into God. And the book, again, the book of Romans says there's groanings too deep for words. I don't know how to pray. And so that tongues helps us in our prayer life. The Bible talks a lot about praying in the spirit. Is this thing that it says and praying always in the spirit, praying in the spirit. It's over and over. If you're sensitive to that, you'll see how many times the Bible says we need to be praying in the spirit. We need to be praying with that gift that God has given. The Bible talks about in spiritual warfare in Ephesians. It talks about praying all with all prayer in the spirit. And so there's this, this, this spiritual language that God has given us for spiritual warfare to help us to, to, to be able to plug in directly with him. And again, it's something we ought to be desiring. Will everyone speak with tongues? No. The last chapter, uh, actually chapter 12, he's saying, do everybody speak in tongues? No, they don't. No, they don't. Everyone, not everybody will have that gift. Can you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit without speaking in tongues? Absolutely. Though, most of the time we see evidence of that baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues, but you can be baptized with the Holy Spirit without speaking in tongues. All right, so how are you guys doing? You doing okay so far? Tracking with this? Good, I got about, good, I still got about 60% of you. We're doing good. <laughs> he who speaks in the tongues did not speak to men but to God. For no one understands him. However, in his spirit he speaks mysteries. Look at verse 3. But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. So again, the contrast there in Paul's heart was, be blessed in the church. Don't be, don't be screaming in tongues and say, look how spiritual I am. Run up and down the aisles and, and you know, untie my bota usta olama honda. You know, all this stuff. You know, kind of getting off on this, on this thing. Uh, look, if you're going to do that in church, the Bible says, here's the instruction. We're going to get into that. Here's the instruction within the church. And he's telling them very clearly, look, it needs to be to build it. When we're together, we need to be building one another up. Not, look how great I am. Look, I have this gift. This, this is one of those things that can totally destroy a church. You know, look how, look how spiritual. And if you don't have the gift of tongues, you're much less of a Christian. You just don't have the full gospel. Look around. I'm a full gospel preacher, all right? Think about it. All right, so maybe not. All right, so now listen to this. As he's reasoning, he's talking about tongues. He's talking about tongues. He's talking about prophecy. One blesses the church. One is, is blessing you. He says in verse 5, I wish, you, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more, I wish you prophesied. For he who prophesied is greater than he who speaks with tongue. tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall, shall I profit you unless I speak either by revelation or by knowledge, by prophecy or by teaching? Even things without life, whether, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sound, how will it be known what is piped or played? So you just come and start playing, you know, a trumpet, just, uh, just blowing on it. It's like, that doesn't make any sense. And it's kind of irritating. He says, why would it be any different? You just come speaking in tongues. It doesn't make any sense. People are not edified in that. Right? But you're being built up. He's going to say, you pray, you know, you, you, you praise God well. He's not going to say, don't do it in your prayer life. But in the church, be careful. For if a trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise you, unless you utter the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are... It may be so many kinds of languages in the world. None of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even so, you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, the church was very zealous, wanting to move in this direction. He says this, okay, so you're zealous for these things. You want to go in this direction. He says, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Look at be, be trying to bless one another. Build one another up. Don't be dividing over these things. Again, the church, the church of Corinth was having major problems with this area of spiritual gifts. Some of them, look, make it so that we are building one another up, helping one another. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. 
For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, and my understanding is unfruitful. Listen to that again. Well, first of all, the person to pray is to, is, to, uh, is to seek the interpretation. If you're in a, in a public setting, but you got to be careful. He's going to give some, some warnings on that. Verse 14, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Again, I can feel much broader than I can express. And he says here, when I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Again, my words, my vocabulary, it, it gets in the way sometimes. What is the conclusion then? He says, I'll pray with the spirit, and I will pray with my understanding. I'll sing in the spirit, and I will also sing in my understanding. You know, you, know, you can hear Paul saying, this is an awesome thing. This is a blessing to do. Don't just say, well, I don't want no part of it because I don't understand it. No, you need, to, you need to spend time with God in these areas. It's very cool to hear responses between the services, what's going on with people saying, you know what, I started to go in this direction and God gave me that language, and, but I, I, I didn't want to, I was afraid of it. Well, don't be afraid. Spend time with God. Press in with God. You know, now in the church is another thing. You don't need to practice here. You need to practice in your prayer closet, right? It says here, otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uniform say amen? If uh, at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you're saying. So in the church, in the church, nobody understands what you're saying. How can they say amen to that? For indeed, I love verse 17, because he doesn't just say, you know what? So you're totally doing it wrong. You need to stop this. He doesn't say that. He says, you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. You're, doing, you're, you're giving thanks well, but others, they're not being edified. I think, now look at verse 18. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than y'all. You hear that southern drawl right there. <laughs> I thank God I speak with you more than, I speak in tongues more than y'all. So he's speaking in tongues. He says, look, I praise God that I speak with tongues. More than all of you guys speak in tongues. Yet in the church, verse 19, in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding than I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brethren, do not be children in, underst in understanding. However, in malice be babes, in understanding be mature. He says, be mature in these things. Be, don't, be, don't be hurting one another with a gift that God has given you. And he says here, in the church, for the building up of the church, for the edifying of the church. So I'd rather speak five words in understanding than just babble on for, for 10,000 words. Within the church, again, building up. Doesn't mean don't spend time with God alone. In fact, he's going to say in the church, this is the way, to, to, this is the instruction for in the church. But here's the thing is that don't, don't say, well, then I don't want no part of this. We really need to be seeking God in all that God has for us. I really need help in my prayer life. And this is, this is one of those things that God has given us. It's a tool that God has given us in our arsenal uh, for spiritual warfare, for drawing close to him. And that'd be something that we seek. I'm, I'm very opinionated on this. I know not everybody will speak in tongues. I know the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes even without speaking in tongues. Billy Graham, God's anointed that man. There's millions of people in the kingdom for the rippling effect from his life. And he says he never spoke with tongues. And yet understands the baptism of the Holy Spirit and understands that. Walter Martin, if you've been listening to him, he comes on in the morning, uh, on Sunday morning. And a uh, great Bible teacher. He's a man that did one of the best teaching I ever heard on this gift of, uh, speaking on the gift of tongues. And yet says, said, he, you know, he's in heaven now, said that he didn't have this gift. So you can, you can be filled with the Spirit, understand this, and not speak with tongues. I'm more opinionated um, and think you ought to seek it. Press in. Cl draw close to God. Draw close to God in your prayer time, alone with Him. Yet in the church, He says, five words is better than 10,000 rambling on. And then He uses Isaiah 28. You can also find it in Deuteronomy 28. He quotes this section talking about how it's a, it's a sign when they're done right and someone comes in that, that, that doesn't, doesn't understand, they're not Christians, and they, this is done right, it's a, it's a judgment to them to say, you know what, I need to get right with God. And look what he says here. In the law it's written, With men of other tongues and other lips I will speak to this people. And yet for all that they will not hear me, says the Lord. Therefore tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. For prophesying is, for un is not for unbelievers, but those who believe. So he says tongues, when they're done correctly, when the spiritual gifts are moving correctly, then there's a blessing that comes. People go, you know what, God's in this place. You ever been in a charismatic church? Because we're Calvary Chapel here. 
right? We have a lot of people from all different walks of life, and, and it's very rare that you'll see in this kind of setting, very rare, you'll see this kind of setting, those kind of gifts operating. It's not that rare in smaller groups where you have a leader that understands those. Pastor John's got a, a, a group going on in his house. I don't know if he started that or getting ready to start that. He's uh, been talking about it. But, but to, and here he says here, if they come in and it's done correctly, that could be a huge witness. But when it's not done correctly, look what it says in verse 23. He says, therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues and there comes in those who are uninformed or un unbelievers, well, they're not saying you're out of your mind. So all of a sudden we just stand up and start, okay, let's practice this thing. You know, we all stand up and start speaking in tongues and someone comes in and go, what are you doing? What is that about? They don't understand. They've been taught on these things. I've seen that happen. Watch people run out of churches when I was in that charismatic circles. People going in going, what is going on? The Bible says don't do that. I don't understand that. Why churches don't read the Bible and understand the Bible? Biblically, in a church setting, in an open church setting, it is wrong for people to stand up and everybody speak with tongues. According to the word of God. Now, don't throw it out. God, that's a gift that God blesses. But the thing is this, in the church, that's not supposed to be happening. And yet how many churches, and I'm not pointing fingers at churches, I'm just making it, this is what the Word of God says. This is what the Word of God says. So I, I, I was in a charismatic church for a long time. That's all my background, all my coming up in, in, in the Lord was all the charismatic movement. And, and, uh, and man, we, we learned to stand up and shout hallelujah in tongues and, and, and without interpretation, without all those things. All these things were happening. Never once did we go to this passage. Never once we say, you know what? The Bible says we're not supposed to be doing that. Because somebody comes in unaware and unaformed, man, they're going to say, you're out of your mind. And, that's, and, and they'll say, you know, what are you guys doing? What are you guys doing? But if they come in and prophesy, believer, uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all. and he is gonna, Again, when it's done right, when it's done right, man, the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. I tell you what, when it's done right, man, when church is done right, when prophecy is moving, I've had people say to me, I don't know how many times, people come in, bring somebody that doesn't know the Lord, come into this place, and they leave, and they, and in fact, I have people get mad at me and say, you know what, I can't believe that so-and-so told you all about me, and that's why you, you, you were talking about what you talked about today. <laughs> so, I don't have a clue who you are, and I don't know what you're talking about. The Holy Spirit does that. The Holy Spirit pinpoints people. And when that happens, people say, you know what, God is in this place, and they're convicted, and they're challenged when the Spirit of God is moving. He says here, look at verse 26, and I wish I could spend more time on all this. We're going to run out of time. And then, how is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation, let all things be done for edification. So he's, and, and notice verse 40, it says, let all things be done to decency and order. So what's he doing here? He's saying, look, he says, you come together and there's chaos. Somebody's over here speaking in tongues. Someone's over here singing. Somebody's over here doing this, and there's chaos. He said, no, no. Let's th let everything be done in decency and order. If, if someone speaks in a tongue, let there be two, or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. So they start standing up and, and speaking in tongues. The pastor needs to go, you know what? Hold on a second. The Bible says we're going to do this one at a time. And we're going to wait upon that interpretation. But if there is no interpretation, it says, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. Right? Is that what's going on? Is that, is that biblical what's going on? Look at verse 30. If anything is revealed to one another who sits by, let the first keep silent. And you can all prophesy one by one and that, that all may learn and may be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So you're not going to say, well, you know what? I just had to do that. God told me to do it. I just couldn't help myself. By the Spirit of God, he lifted me up and I started screaming in tongues. No, no, you, you, you can control that. Okay? And, and we ought to be judging these things. It says, verse 29, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So there's, it's a church that's out of control, chaos. He's saying, this is the way to have church. You want to speak in tongues? Great. Here's how you do it. A, B, C. Right? I love the next verse. One of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. Let your women keep silent in the churches. I, that's, it's Bible. You get all upset all you want. 
to your women, keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak. You're doing this when you should be doing this. All right? <laughs> I love the Bible. But they are, they are to be submissive, uh, as the law also states. Now notice what it says in verse 35. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. For it is shameful for a woman to speak in a church. Shameful. Or did the word of God come originally to you, or was it only that it reached? Now, here's the thing. I love this verse. Now you got to know the, what's going on. What's the context of this? What is this? What is going on? You got to understand uh, there's a couple things, and let me just tell you, this is the facts, all right? Uh, in, in many of the third world countries today, in Africa, we're just in Africa, and uh, one of the places, one of the churches that was out and they asked me to do a, a greeting to the church, one of the things I noticed as I was looking at the church is, first of all, and I'll come back to this because this is part of what's being said here, the women were on one side and the men were on the other. Okay, so I noticed that right up front. That's cool. That's biblical. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, first century church right there. That's the way they were doing first century. I also noticed, and I'm glad I asked the pastor before I say anything, I also noticed that the women didn't have any Bibles, but the men did. Okay, and they were even, there was a lot of Bibles there. They, need, they needed some Bibles. But the, the men had Bibles, the women did not have Bibles. And I asked the pastor, I said, how come, they're not, how come the women are not bringing their Bibles? He says, because they don't know how to read. They're not educated. Well, why is that? Well, there's no schools for them. There's no schools for the gals. There's schools for the, for the boys. There's schools for them. In fact, one of the communities we went to, Compassion International, was doing something out of the box. They were doing a, which there was none even within hundreds of miles of this, of this school, is what they were doing is they were putting in a school for boys and girls. I thought, that's awesome. This is revolutionary thinking in Africa. And some of these and some of these things because the gals were not educated that goes back there's a, that that still happens today that was in middle eastern culture that was in bible times the men learned the word they learned they went to torah school the the gals did not learn it in fact even today in the synagogues and things they, they don't have women uh involved in the same level of understanding in fact they even did a movie about that remember barbara streisand did a movie about a remember that gentle, G gentle. gentle. Yantel. Yeah, that was a whole, because it's a cultural thing. The women are not to be learning the Torah, not to be learning the scriptures. They're to be home, homemakers, you know, barefoot and pregnant. Not a bad idea, but um, <laughs> whatever. I'm just kidding. Totally kidding, all right? Don't get all upset. But uh, so, so the women would ask these questions, and they said, look, if you have a question, ask your husband at home. You need to be schooled in these things, and, and, the, and the husbands need to be schooling you. That's one part of it, all right? The other part of it is this, the women were separated from the men. And so you see this in Capernaum, go with us to Israel. I'll show you what the synagogue of Capernaum looked like, the one that Jesus would have, would have taught in. The early church picked up the whole format of the, of the synagogue service. In Capernaum, you stand on the lower floor, you see the place where the, where the rabbi would, would teach, where all these things went on, look, up, look upstairs. You've got to really look, because there's a doorway up there, and upstairs, that's where the women were at. So the women were upstairs, the men were downstairs. The women were separated, sometimes between, but separated with a, with a wall, kind of a, a lattice wall. All, the women were separated. And so you'd have this separation. So the women were yelling across over at their husband, hey, what did he say? And so there was this chaos going on. And he says, look, it's shameful for women to do that. That's what he's saying. That's the context of it. It's shameful for women to do that. Look, if you have something to ask your husbands, you have something to ask, ask your own husbands at home. Don't be yelling it in the church. Again, remember context here. It's all about chaos. This church is out of control. Tongues are out of control. Prophecies out of control. You know, the, the women are, uh, you know, are, are causing this big ruckus, you know. And, and so he's saying, look, you need to keep silent in the churches. If you have something to ask, ask your husband when you get home. But this is not the place to do that. Okay, so that, I don't like explaining it. I just like just leaving it hanging because it's so much more useful to our culture. <laughs> but it's not, but that's not... That's not good Bible, though, to not, to not give the understanding. If anyone thinks himself, that I, I like what he says here. We're going to finish this up. I like what he says here. He says in verse 37, if anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual. So you think you're spiritual in this. You think you're a prophet in this? Okay. Let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of God. And if anyone's ignorant, let him be ignorant. So he says, look, if they truly are spiritual... They're not going to come against this. They're going to say, you know what? This is true. And if they want to stay ignorant, let them stay ignorant. I like this little, it's kind of a little flippant uh, 
remark he makes here. You know, you want to be a fool? Be a fool, whatever, you know. But if you're truly spiritual, you're going to agree with what has just been said here. And that's, that's what he's saying. Okay, I like that. I like him just saying, look, you know, we need to put this on the table. You know, if you don't want to agree with it, then, you know, be an idiot. And that's it's, it's very, very flippant what he's saying there, uh, but, but very accurate. You know, you want to stay that way? Stay that way. But if you're truly spiritual, you're going to hear the heart in this. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy. Now listen to this. And I don't believe God has changed this view here. And do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things, and yet he says, let all things be done in decency and order. So this whole thing about tongues and interpretation and prophecy, you run through it very quickly. It's hard to get a handle unless you already have a background in this. And then, then, you, then you can catch it. Thing is this, I'm going to encourage you. This is free. You can go online. Pastor Chuck Smith has written uh, on this topic using these texts and kind of gone more through it than I'm able to go through it in, in a 45-minute time I have. It's called Charisma versus Charismania. You go to our website. You should be able to get it from there. You can get it definitely from Word for Today uh, website. It's a, it's a book. You can either buy it in our bookstore if there's any left. I saw a bunch of people with them after the first service. You can either buy them in our bookstore or you can order them from there, order them offline, or you can, or you can get uh, free. You can, you know, just... Just uh, click on the link and print it to your printer. Then you have the book. Uh, Charisma versus Charismania. We'll walk through this. Charis, uh, char uh, the, the Charismaniac section of it. The ones that, uh, that what, what is that all? These people that are just running with these things versus what is the spiritual gift that the Bible speaks about. And, there's, and so that, that book is online. There's another one that he's written that is very well done. It's called Living Water. That's also online. You can catch that there. It's a little, little bit more in-depth on the gifts of the Spirit. Very, very scholarly, very well done. You get those under your belt, you have a good understanding of this. I'm going to encourage you to do this. I'm going to encourage you to seek God in this. See God in your prayer time. See God in this area. God, fill me with your spirit. Don't be afraid. Because what we read a couple weeks ago out of Luke's gospel, it's again in Matthew, uh, the parallel account. It says, if you ask for a stone, if your son asks for a stone, will, will you give him a scorpion? You know, if you ask for a bread, will you give him a stone? If you ask for egg, will you give him a scorpion? You know how to good, give good gifts to your children. How much more our Father wants to give the Holy Spirit to him who asks? And so we, we come to our Father saying, God, I want all that you have for me. And what God does, he begins to fill you with the Spirit. Prayer, the prayer life, prayer language will, will, will so enhance your prayer time. But he begins to fill you with the whole, it's like a glass up here. I love this analogy. It's like a glass that has a, that's half full of sludge. You know, and you take that glass that's what, you, what is in your heart. And you take that, open up a, open up a, a, a faucet. And you take that. And you put it underneath that faucet, that living water. You know what living water means flowing water. You put it underneath there. God, I want, to, I want all that you have for me, Lord. Fill me with your spirit. Here it comes. Fill me with your spirit, Lord. All this stuff comes to the surface. Now you have to deal with it. You have to make get things right because it's coming up. Now it's surface. Now you got to deal with this stuff. Oh, Lord, I, 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 need to do, I need to ask you to forgive me of that. And then all this stuff comes to the surface. But stay under the spout where the glory comes out. Stay under that place where the Holy Spirit's, oh, Holy Spirit's filling you to overflowing. Because what's happening now, he'll begin to cleanse you. And all that stuff will come out. And many times, many times, one of those gifts he gives is, is tongues for, for prayer. And to really be able to express your love for him. It's a powerful thing. But the bottom line is this, child of God. Press in. Press in. Know the God that you serve. Know the God. You say you love him. Man, press in. Press in. He wants to give you so much joy and fill you with overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Get all that junk out of your life. Stay right there in the spout. Tell yourself, I'm going to stay in the spout where the glory comes out, Lord. I'm going to stay right here on my knees. I'm going to stay on my knees until, until I hear from you, God. God, I want to, and this is your prayer time, you alone with God. God, I want you to cleanse me. God, I need you. And see what happens. I tell you what, we got testimonies in this room next week. If you'll press in, God's going to, the Bible says, draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Put that to the test. Draw near to him. See what happens. Well, I don't know. I start praying and I start thinking of all these things that I've done wrong. Yeah, here comes a sludge to the top. Oh, I just, oh, I just, oh, I don't want to do this. This is too hard. God's wanting me to do all that. Here comes a sludge to the top. Keep going. Keep going because it will overflow. And that fresh water, 
Man, you want to, this is, this is a joyous life. You know why? Because you stay right there and let God keep cleansing you. All that garbage, all that garbage. I keep putting garbage in my cup. I keep getting garbage in there and God keeps <laughs> back again, you know, and more and more cleansing. Good stuff. I tell you what, good stuff. Seek God, press in, know him. Tell you what, life will never be the same again.